Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're so glad that you're here. And we're so glad that we have a show today. So everything has been going wrong that could go wrong. I lost power. So I had to move to the TechSmith studio. So that's why things look a little different today. Hope everything sounds good and looks good. But let's get on with our day because, you know, I've been I've been waiting for this for a long time. We've been trying to coordinate and make this happen. And it's the day is finally here. So I'm really grateful for this day and the opportunity because we have not one, but two fantastic guests with us here on the Visual Lounge. So let's go ahead and, and do a little introduction of our fantastic guests. So first of all, we've got Jess Jackson. She brings a background of social justice, dialogue facilitation, restorative justice practices, and DEI consulting to instructional design. She's a TEDx speaker and an award-winning educator. She's a current XAPI cohort host and an instructional designer and project manager at Torrance Learning. In her spare time, she serves on the board of directors of her neighborhood association, enjoys bonfires, yoga, thrifting, and spending time with her wife and dogs. Also with us today is Megan Torrance. She is the CEO and founder of Torrance Learning, which helps organizations connect learning strategy to design, development, data, and ultimately performance. Megan has over 25 years of experience in learning, design, development, and consulting. Megan and the Torrance Learning team are passionate about sharing what works in learning, so they devote considerable time to teaching and sharing about agile project management and learning for experience design in XAPI. She's the author of Agile for Instructional Designers, the quick guide to, to LAMA, L-L-A-M-A. -A. She can tell us about that later. And Making Sense of XAPI. Megan is also an eCornell facilitator in the Women's Executive Leadership Curriculum. And with that said, I want to welcome Jess and Megan to the Visual Lounge. Hey, how are you guys? Wow. Doing well. Good to see you. It's, it's, it's good to be seen. I mean, you know, like I said, it's <laughs> one of those days. But well, thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. Before we get kind of dive it into things, you know, bios are, are always great because they, they sound really good and we, we usually take time to craft them. Is there anything else that we should know about you guys before we start into our, our conversation today? Jess, we can start with you. Anything we should know about you, Jess? Uh, I think you captured my professional acumen pretty well. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, I would say, and this is probably rooted in my DEI perspective, is that I'm just human. Um, I think that a lot of what we do around diversity, equity, and inclusion humbles us and helps us to recognize our humanity and how we display empathy to one another. And I try to lead with that. So I try to lead with vulnerability and humanity um, and, and recognizing how we all connect and how we all are different. So thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah. Well, I, can, can I just say I love that, that I'm just human. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's true. I'm just human. I love that. All right, Megan, what about you? Anything else we need to know about Megan Torrance? Yeah, you know, it's it's something I get from one of my grandmothers. Um, I can't stop teaching and sharing and building learning experiences. So like the, the, the running joke is that, you know, what's my hobby? Well, generally my hobby involves helping somebody else learn something. Um, so I've been a hockey coach. I'm now creating like um, some, some community ed programs for autistic young adults, doing a bunch of different things. But it, there's there's a, a pattern here is that I learn something and then I turn around and share it. So um, and that's kind of the what we're I mean, that's what you do. Right. So, I mean, that's that's nothing unique. And probably most people in our professions, that's kind of our compulsion to do things. Well, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of uh, I think a lot of us who have that innate, but I know, you, but you do it so well, Megan. So it's it's good to be part of that uh, in that group with you. So okay, so today we want to talk about a topic that is uh, I think very important for not just for instructional design. It's it's not just you know it's any company needs to be thinking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're going to start broad, and then we're going to get na more narrow here. So let's start with really really high level because. We, we throw around the term DEI a lot, and I want to hear from uh, the two of you, what does that really, like, what are we really talking about? Let's define when we say diversity, equity, inclusion, what are we, what are we talking about? So then we can put that in context of other things for today. 
Absolutely. Yes, I can start and then start? Megan, if you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, uh, I, I like to root everything in humanity, right? Like that was the one thing. Um, and we all show up to work with our humanity, whether that be our different, our racial identities, whether it be our genders, whether it be um, our neural diversity, like there are different things that we all carry and bring with us. So diversity is all around representation of those differences, right? Like when you hear the word diversity, we're thinking differences um, and differences across a, a lot of different um, categories. And in a resource guide that we're going to share a little later, um, we have a social identity matrix, which helps you to explore some aspects of that. Um, equity is around, I would say, righting the wrongs of injustice that are related to those social identities, right? So we know historically from a U.S. perspective, I'm in Brazil right now, but um, I am biased by my U.S. perspective. Um, there are some social identities, for example, race, racially. We know some social identities have been historically centered and um, uplifted, right? And there are some racial identity groups which have been marginalized, disenfranchised through legal legislation um, and excluded. And those things show up. And so equity to me is all about how are we righting those wrongs? How are we overcoming that injustice? Which means that we have to acknowledge, and, and I appreciate how you said this is a very important topic, but it's a very sensitive topic because mm -hmm. we have to acknowledge the wrongs, right? We have to, we have to be um, transparent about the history so that we can have a better future. Um, inclusion is all around, now that we're, we have diverse representation, we're able to identify ways that injustice has impacted our relationships, um, um, inclusion is about how are we welcoming people to the table, right? Um, across those lines of difference, how are we um, how are we listening to different musics that inc that include different cultures? How are we having different food? That's what inclusion. And I would add another layer that we've added to our perspective of DEI, which is belonging, right? Um, which is how folks feel in those environments. Do I feel like I fit in here? Do I feel like I can be myself? Can I bring my whole self to this space? Or are there parts of myself that I have to turn down or, or, or shut out in order to be welcomed here? Um, so that, that's kind of my perspective of DEIB. Um, what, what are your thoughts, Megan? Well, and so, it, so, so, so Jess is right educated in this. You've got 15 years of of, of academic and 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 experiential learning um, and sharing around this, um, and um, I'm looking at these issues from from two lenses, right? So one is my my own lens, right? So someone um, who is learning about many of these things, um, uh, and and in order to right some wrongs, we have to even be aware of them, which makes us realize that mm -hmm. that that there are things that don't come up, right? There are things that haven't been taught. There are things that we're not aware of. And so even that process is, is, is part of that, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I'm also looking at how do we, how do, how do we teach around DEI topics? Absolutely. But how do we as instructional designers or, or learning and development organizations, right? We have this really interesting opportunity in the organizations we work in because we touch everybody, every employee, every, in some cases, every customer is touched by the work that we do. And, and so if we think it's just about this DEIB training um, and these initiatives, we're missing the point because we are the message. And that mm. is, is a big responsibility. Um, and I know that for many people, um, not having that insight, not having the kind of training and experience and history you have with it, that could be a daunting space because all of a sudden, as I start to learn more, I become terrified I'm going to screw it up. And to Matt's point, this is really sensitive and screwing it up is, is, is painful for everybody involved. Well, can, can, mm -hmm. I, can, can, I, can I just say, uh, as, as someone who, uh, coming, approaching this topic and, and, and you know, wanting to I want to be a good person here on this. I want to do this right. I, I will say that I, I, I'm a little nervous, right? I don't want to say the wrong thing. I mm -hmm. want to be, I want to be, I want to expand my knowledge and grow and be aware. 
Um, and so I, I really can appreciate that. And so please, if I'm, if a question I ask or something I say, you know, hits, hits the wrong way, please let me know so I can fix it. Uh, cause we want, I, but I, I do want to learn. And I think we have a lot of, a lot of places that we can go in this. So, um, Today is a little different, so I'm going to bring up my notes here. I don't normally look like this. Uh, okay, so, and I think you've talked about this, but, you know, Megan, you, you made the point about, like, you know, this is obviously across the organization, uh, instructional design tr training, HR, obviously, is the message, as you said. Um, so in the workplace in particular, and obviously, I think from what I'm, just what I'm hearing, you say it makes so much sense, right? Like, we've got people who, who, we need to right some of those wrongs. We need to make things more inclusive and feel more able to belong. And there's a lot of places that still doesn't happen. So, so where do we go? Like just high level, again, kind of high level, where do organizations start? If they're, if they're not on this journey already, already, hopefully many of them are, but if not, they're saying, if someone's watching this and says like, I don't even know where to begin in my organization, where should we start? Yeah. And I, I appreciate, um, Go ahead, Megan. No. Oh, no, 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 go. You're right. Yes, go. I, I wanted to, I appreciate Megan's comment around how the work that we do in instructional design touches everybody and why DEIB can't just be a singular touch point, right? It has to be integrated in everything that we do. Because this is about, again, and I also appreciate you owning that this is uncomfortable, right? When they're, when you're acknowledging your big learning gaps, right? Like this is something I haven't considered. This is something I don't know. That's uncomfortable for all of us, regardless of what we're learning. Um, and the fact that we now could be impacting other people and causing harm, that's even more intense. So I appreciate that perspective. And I think that we all come to that place um, when we're having these conversations. Uh, I when you're thinking about where to start around DEIB, um, it's one owning that this is an integrative issue and it is a part of all of our roles and responsibilities, right? If you are creating media and your media now triggers certain groups or certain identity groups where they now can no longer engage, right? You've caused harm and also your media is not impactful. Right. Like we want to make sure that what we're doing actually reach, reaches the outcomes that we have for all people within our organizations. So I would say that when folks are um, asking where to start, make this a priority. It's something that you have to acknowledge um, matters for all of our work, whether it is in the media that we're designing, the media that we're selecting or the vendors that we're using and the tools that we're using. These are this is a principle that can be integrated into everything that you're doing. Um, and so after you realize, hey, this is a priority for my work, this is something whether I'm acknowledging there's lots of gaps of knowledge that I don't know, um, or there are areas of improvement that I can identify based off of what's what I'm I'm seeing in feedback from my, my learners, right? Um, it is that assessment, right? How are you identifying the gaps within what you're doing in your work um, and, and how it relates to DEI? So make it a priority. Um, and that usually stops, starts at the top, right? Like I, I'm mm -hmm. very privileged to have worked with Torrance Learning where Megan has made this uh, a priority within our organization as CEO. Um, and then we're able to assess or analyze and we have in the resource guide again, a way to kind of think about that, right? Like where do some gaps show up um, in terms of people's experiences, in terms of how folks are responding to our content, in terms of the, the topics that we're covering and the perspectives that we're centering. Um, when you start to identify some of those gaps, then you have a place to start, right? And you can build from there and have a very outcomes-based approach, a measured approach to the impact that you want to make. Um, and one of the things that we're going to talk about today um, are inclusive media choices, right? Um, mm -hmm. And doing some inclusive visual design. Um, and that that's another place to start, right? And that's going to help you to think about um, where are those gaps again. So one of the questions I, I want to ask, um, since you brought it up, Jess, is the, you know, Torrance is a, you know, we should probably ad ad establish that it's a, you're a small business, Michigan based, which we love, go Michigan, uh, not necessarily the university, but the state, right? Uh, for, for those Michigan state fans, got uh, got to, you know, rep right, I guess. I, anyway. I'm okay uh, with go blue all day. <laughs> all right. So absolutely. Uh, so my question is like for, for, for Torrance as a small business, it, you would, 
and I'm not saying no one should, everyone should do this, right? But from a small business, it seems like probably hard to make that a priority and say like, gosh, of all the million things that we have to do, let's make this a priority. So Megan, I'd love to hear like, what was the thinking about like putting the emphasis in that spot at this time um, and not, you know, instead versus all the other things you could probably do with the time and resources effort that you're, you have. Wait, you don't have 27 hours in your day? I, I do not. I know you somehow make it work that way, but I, I don't. <laughs> well, I think what's, what's interesting, right, is, is it doesn't necessarily have to take more time. It might take more time. Some of the things that you do may take more time um, and, 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 and require. But it's, it's, it's a mindset and approach that can be layered on everything you're already doing. Right. So um, it, when it comes to building an inclusive environment, right, I can connect with each individual for the human that they are and the gifts that they bring and the work that they do and the supports I can provide regardless of any social identity, right? Regardless of, of race or gender or age or, of, you know, physical, but any of those things. Right. Um, and so in, in some respects, the very things that we're going to do in order to make an inclusive environment are helpful for everybody, right? So, so I think about some of my early, early work um, in, in the, the, the training space was around creating training for the rollout of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I've just dated myself, right? Um, but, you know, so at the time, yes, you know what? Installing a ramp costs money. Um, when you're building the building, it's actually, you could build a ramp or you could build stairs. And the difference is, you know, depending on where it is, right? Um, the, the difference is not that material, right? Um, but when you build a ramp, yes, you help people who are wheelchair users. You help people who, you, you help your moving crew move your furniture in. You help people with baby strollers, you help the UPS person who's bringing you, you know, your, your stuff. There's all sorts of things that doing something that had historically been thought of as something we only did to accommodate um, someone who was a wheelchair user suddenly becomes so much more natural to all of the workflow. And so that's some of the lens that we look at this, right? Um, it doesn't always take a lot more effort. Sometimes it absolutely does. And that's when your, your values as an organization, your values as a leader, your values of a, as a person, right, come to play. One of our core values is people first. And so if we're not thinking people first, we are liable to, to make some mistakes. Actually, you know what? We are going to make mistakes. We're just going to socialize this. We're going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Some point in this conversation, one of the three of us will make a mistake, and we will learn from it and be better for it. Well, I, I, well, I love that. That I love that you you've brought in this, and and really, I think, I think oftentimes when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, you know, I love that you opened it up to be this even broader, like it's, it really helps everybody. It's, I, and so I, I really love that perspective. I think that's really an important one because I, I, I think it's easy for me as someone of privilege, you know, in a very privileged position, I want to recognize, I know I'm in a very privileged position in my life. It's for easy for me to maybe forget that, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be just good for me. It, it needs, it could be good for everybody. And that's going to still make my life easier. Cause I agree. I like, I love a good ramp, you know, for lots of reasons, uh, <laughs> versus stairs. Um, so l let me, uh, so gosh, so, so many questions in my head right now, but one of them that I want to talk about is like, I, obviously we, we can spend a lot of time defining it, talking about what it is and, and that's good. And I think there's probably a thousand conversations that need to happen in that area. But today, I, w one of the things I want to know is like, particularly because we're going to be talking about image. We talk, need to talk about images and video at some point, but how do you know if you're doing, gosh, I don't even want to say enough. Cause I don't, I don't, you know, it's like, I don't know if there is enough. How do you know if you're nailing this? Can, can you, is there a point where you can say like, yes, we're, we're at least doing a good job here at, at this process. Cause obviously, as you said, Megan, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to, it's going to, it's a, it's a process, not a, like, I don't know if there, that there's a, like a one destination we've done. Oh, we did. 
We did DEI, now we're done with it. Uh, that's, that's not how it works, right? So how do you know if you're on the right track of being like, okay, we're, we're moving in that right direction? Any thoughts from the both of you? You know, what comes to mind are, are um, like two, two company lines, uh, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't years and years ago, I'm gonna get this wrong, Avis, we're second best or we're, the, we're number two, right? And it was that, they, 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 their, their advertising led with that um, because they were, it meant to them that they were always working harder at it, mm. right? Um, Johnsonville Sausage, part of their, um, their, their mission and their values, right? It's, we are becoming better sausage makers, not the best, right? They are becoming. And, and that, that point at which you, you, you it's not a, ch it's not a check the box, right? If all I'm doing is, is passing out training and making everybody take the training, then it absolutely is check the box. But, right. um, it's it's right you're you're always learning more and i think even um as 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 our cultures move and new dimensions of our identities um take hold as different activist movements um bring different things to the forefront um, we're learning about new dimensions in which power dynamics are keeping others um at bay, like, I think there's, there's, I can't envision a world in which we will have nailed it, unfortunately, as much as I yeah. want to, because I, 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 it frustrates the daylights out of me. Um, but we ask questions and, and, and we, we survey our team twice a year. Um, we uh, have very open conversations about them. Um, that of course, assumes an environment of psychological safety um, in which people can answer questions, um, as well as an environment of enough awareness to be able to um, identify when they see issues of bias happening, right? Um, you can be connecting with um, your your market, right? Your consumers, your customers, who, whoever. Um, and then asking experts and asking people who have the lived experiences that you don't, right? Um, are we are we hitting it, right? Um, just can I tell this story about when I asked about what our little town felt like? And I don't want to trash our little town, but you know, so my company is based in a cute, quaint, upper Midwest little town. And um, I think of it as a perfectly wonderful safe place to raise it's like i'm here to raise a family here right it's a wonderful place and i remember and just maybe you remember the actual words was like not everybody feels safe in my town i don't just do you want to pick that up and 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 where that conversation <laughs> was going yeah um absolutely so i would commute to my office and I'm not an early morning riser. Um, I'm from Detroit, which is about 45 minutes from Chelsea, which is where Megan is talking about. Um, and Detroit is an urban center. Um, a it's the blackest city in America. Um, and I would commute from Detroit in early morning and I would blast my music. <laughs> I just play my music really loudly so that I'm driving um, to wake up so that I could be ready to be in the office. But as soon as I hit Chelsea limits, I would turn my music down, straighten my back, hold both wheels, right? Because I'm very aware of what I look like as a black woman in this town. Um, and so as Megan and I talk about what safety feels like, uh, I have a different lived experience, right? And so what it looks like to feel safe in environments um, is gonna be different for me than it is for Megan. Um, and, and those were things that we've, we've used this word, this is based, but those are bias, or those are things that we haven't, I, we use blind spot, but I haven't found another word for it. It's based off of a book, but um, it's a blind spot that Megan has that is ableist language um, that, that that's not her experience, right? Um, and so as we think about DEI work and, and your question um, around how do we know that we're getting it right? The reality is the world that we live in, there are disproportionate gaps across every social determinant of health because of inequity in our world. If we put all of that work on us, we're never going to make an impact. We're never going to be able to change everything. So I think one is having realistic expectations around your locus of control. 
Like what is the work that you're doing and what type of impact can you be making? Um, and, and that comes from two different perspectives, right? There's the reactive perspective, right? Okay, so if something happens to Jess on her way to work as our employee, how do we respond to that? What is the mm -hmm. reaction? Where is our support? What are the things there? But there's also the proactive consideration where we're thinking about okay, how are we cultivating a welcoming space once our employees from diverse backgrounds get into the office, right? Um, what are the things that we're considering before they even tell us? Um, and so I think that when you want to make sure that you're doing good work, I, I would challenge you to have both perspectives. What's your response when harm is caused, right? What is your protocol? What are your resources? And then what are you doing proactively to make sure that you're considering some of the needs of diverse employees um, and, and diverse learners and, and diverse audiences um, so that you're not just reacting and responding? Um, so I would say it's a balance of both. And if you can get that nice balance and continue to learn, like Megan said, we assess our climate twice a year, right? It's never going to be perfect, but we're continuing to assess and learn and try to meet benchmarks and close gaps. That's going to, that tells to me that you're on the right path. Well, I love it. I love it. So I, I think that actually uh, leads to, to my next question of, of kind of transitioning to talking about media. So, uh, you know, as a, a tech company, we, we create our tools, create a lot of media. And I'm curious to, to, to hear from you guys, the two of you, I got to watch, I'm going to say, I'm, I, I, I know I shouldn't use guys, but I use it all the time. So I'm going to catch myself. Uh, I want to hear like, okay, because it seems like how I see the media around me impacts, you know, how I view the world, right? Like if, if all the media looks a certain way, so the images, the videos that maybe even I'm creating. So how, how, how do we get better, particularly in this area, at, at either selecting media? Like what kind of questions? I don't, I'm not even sure if I, I know what I want to ask here. Like is there, are there questions we should be asking? Are there certain things we should be looking for? I know there's no one prescriptive answer because this, it covers such a wide kind of gamut of things, but I, I do want to kind of transition to the image video conversation of, you know, what does that representation look like? How do we, how do we do that well? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, what I, I think it's, it's a process, right? It's something you learn and you have an eye for over time, right? So we built a course on defensive driving. And so I have an entire team, right? It's, it's like a four or six hour course on defensive driving. Um, it's more e-learning about driving than anybody needs to have. Um, but <laughs> right. I, we now have a team of people who can instantly look at a photograph of a, a person in a car to drive and like tell you where in the world they're driving. Um, <laughs> like, has that has that image been fil flipped in order to fit the right world? Are they following all the rules of, of that that um, uh, that the course puts around where you put your thumbs on the steering wheel and where your hands are on the steering wheel and all these where where is the driver's eyes? All these things, right? That they've learned that four years ago before we picked up that client, they're like, okay, person in a car, I grab a picture, person in a car, great, right? <laughs> and nobody looked at it sideways, right? And so this is a learned process that you can learn, um, but it also helped us, right? And I'm purposely taking this out of the DEI space to show mm -hmm. we can all learn these things, but we needed an expert reviewer to help us say, oh, no, see those thumbs? not going to work. Uh, see, that's nine and three, not 10 and two, or, you know, uh, you know, where your hands are in the steel, all these things. So it takes time. Uh, um, and, and, and so for example, we're, we're starting to apply, right? Yes. Our team is all super aware of these things, but we're also uh, starting to apply. Um, and customers are asking us for a, a, an image audit, a media audit, a, a scenario audit, right? Somebody who, because I haven't lived all these experiences, I don't see them as readily because they're not kind of front and center. So we look at not just diversity, but power dynamics, who's being portrayed as a positive or a negative, um, those, what, what are the things, so we're making sure we're not committing more microaggressions simply in our media choices. And that's where Jess has been able to um, completely revamp several of my own PowerPoint decks, right? Um, for classes I teach. Um, so it's it's been really helpful. What have you seen, Jess, in that space? 
Yeah, I would say that there's kind of like three big tips that we've narrowed it down to, although within that we could be even more nuanced, right? Um, but the one is, what's your baseline, right? So an example that we use in some of our presentations are some um, icons that, that Megan used in, in one of her presentations, and it, it's a, a, a woman's face, and the woman's face is replicated multiple times with a few different complexion types, um, a few different hair types, um, a few different eye color types, right? But the 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 dimensions of that face, the the shape of the nose, the shape of the lip, the actual texture of the hair, the things that are actually indicators of our difference are all the same. So the baseline in those images, in those icons, are, are white women. Um, and the, the complexions, there's very narrow complexions. We don't have a very darkly um, hued um, skin tone, right? So that automatically excludes um, um, dark skinned folks, right? So one, what's the baseline in your image as you're reviewing them? Um, is this actually a standard or a baseline that is reflective of diverse individuals? Or is it reflective of um, things that have been historically normalized, historically centered? Um, and, and how can we make sure that the baseline is more diverse there? Um, whether it be when we talk about weddings? Are we including queer representation there? When we talk about um, entering a building, are we using images of folks who have mobility um, impairments, right? Like what are the ways that we're expanding the perspective of our baseline? Um, and then the second thing that Megan touched on is that power differential. We know that there have been, for example, men in leadership, right? Like if, if, if all of our images are displaying men in, in leadership, then we're not challenging the status quo, right? We're not challenging what it means to be a leader and we're not being inclusive to different genders. Um, so as you're evaluating your imagery, look at those power dynamics, who's front and center, Who's leading the conversation? Who's reflecting? How are we reflecting those power differentials across indicators of dress, right? Like in some of our images, we see, oh, men are wearing blazers while um, women of color are wearing T-shirts, right? Like, and does that demonstrate a, a, a dynamic there, a power dynamic there? So what are the indicators of that power differential and how are you kind of challenging that in your media selection? Um, and then I would uh, add to being critical of the the I think that we all come into um, come into our work recognizing that there are certain biases that we we won't ever go to right when it comes to negative depictions of people of color right like we're we're we know that we're not going to position a person of color as a thief or as someone who is causing harm in a situation because that's a stereotype we we know how to challenge some of the normal stereotypes right um, but how are you um, including more positive depictions um, and, and better representation? So one example that we use um, in our presentations, I was looking for theft in the office, right? Like we wanted to show an image of someone stealing while they're in the office. Um, and the there were no people of color when I did that, that stock image search, right? Um, and I was like, okay, the stereotype is debunked. Like we're not, there, we're not going there anymore. We have that. Um, but then when I looked at collaborative tech teams, right, and I'm looking for what a, a team in an office space that's focused on technology is working, I couldn't find a diverse, rep, like a, a team that reflected diversity. They were all mostly millennial aged. They were all a certain body type and ability status, mostly all white. Um, and so as we think about the stereotypes that we're challenging, also making sure we're expanding the narrative of those positive depictions of diverse people. Um, so those would be like my top three. Recognize the power differentials in the imagery. What's your baseline and how are you expanding the baseline? And how are you challenging some of the narratives, um, not just from a stereotypical depiction, but from a positive um, depiction? And then we could get into more things of where do you where are you sourcing your media from, right? Like how are you using what you create, um, and then how are you being inclusive in the, in those things? But those would be my big three. Well, those are those are fantastic because I, I do feel like, you know, it's 
it would be easy to get to get lost in all this and say like, oh, well, this is I, there's so much for me to learn, uh, you know. And I, I so I love that those are very simple guidelines of things that we can just we can just do right. And every piece of media that we're going to include, you know, just ask a couple questions about it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, can can we? Can we get into a scenario here? So I had someone ask me a question, and this was not here in the chat today. Um, and I want to go through the scenario, and I want I want to get your thoughts on it um, from a company kind of company perspective of like what advice would you give to this individual? So um, I'm going to read their question just so I get it right. So let's say a company is really trying to do good, and they're trying to be more inclusive and represent more voices and more people, but the organization as a whole where employees it's not there yet it's like the actual kind of employee body is not as diverse as it would like to be so it's it's going to make some video it's going to make a maybe an hr like a hiring video or maybe it's maybe it's even an onboarding video something like that and they're specifically choosing people to to make it to, so it is inclusive you know there uh a variety of different uh, people of color, you know, mobility issues, all, all kind of, they're doing that, but it, it definitely skews like they're choosing that versus what it, the reality is, especially from a hiring standpoint, you could see where you're maybe feeling like you're telling them what, like, this is what we look like. And it's not what we look like, uh, in terms of the, the body. So is that okay? Like where, where should this company go? Should they be like, yeah, that's great. Make it the way you want it to be versus what the reality is today. Or is there a, a balance there? Or I would love to hear uh, your comments and thoughts. And I know this person is, is keenly interested uh, and it's not me. Uh, I am interested, but I'm not the person to ask the question, uh, but keenly interested <laughs> in, in, in like, uh, what, what are your thoughts about this? And, you know, cause they, I think they had some questions like, is this the right thing to do? Am, am I being disingenuous? And they didn't, they didn't want to be disingenuous either. Mm. Jess, do you want to take a kind that, of societal? Now I can talk about what Torrance Learning does. Yeah, please, Jess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think, I think that this question comes up a lot, actually, um, because folks want to make sure they're doing the right thing. And so sometimes they're overcompensating. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes off as authentic. And I think um, I've been grappling with this a lot, like um, intrinsically, because there's there's competitive schools of thought here, I think, um, because we could we could absolutely this is the ideal we want to showcase um a reflective diversity even though we might not be there this is our benchmark this is our goal right um mm -hmm. there's also uh does this feel disingenuous when the learner is engaging in this content and does it affect their ability to continue engaging or are they like this is this doesn't relate to my experience this doesn't make me so is it is it off-putting for your learner right like that's a consideration to make um and then also Thinking about um, broadly, the broad perspective, like does this reflect a world that we live in? And maybe not in this organization, but is this the world that we live in? And is this the global perspective? So I think that there are so many different like answers. And I would say that what is your business goal um, in terms of the impact that you wanna make um, with your content? and be authentic to that um if they're if you're saying right now we're uh ramping up our recruitment to to increase the the number of diverse candidates that we get and the number of diverse hires that we have and we want our content to reflect that if that is your goal um, and that's what you're you're setting up your outcome to be then stick with that and be authentic in that narrative. Um, if you want to focus on your current employees and make sure that the learning is reflective of who they are um, and feels more inclusive to them at the current state, then then make content that is reflective of your employees. In fact, use use imagery from your actual workplace instead of sourcing outside um, outside content. Um, but but be authentic in your approach and align it to that bottom that bottom goal. Like what is what is your intention there? Um, if there's no clear intention um, and you're just doing things to do things and you haven't communicated that, and and there's also ways to like to express both perspectives, right? Like our goal is to have a more, 
like you can have a, a, a disclaimer or a note in your content that says, we are working on increasing um, the representation of our, our staff to 20% diversity by this date. And you'll see that reflected here, right? And, and letting the learner know that that's why you've chosen that, that number of, of diversity in there so that they're aware. Or acknowledging and owning your gaps. Like we recognize that this content doesn't feature as many diverse um, individuals. And this is why, because whatever x y and z so there are ways to like be authentic and why you're doing what you're doing um and then also i would say get feedback from the learner you never want to put out content that's not going to be impactful the point of producing learning content is to increase performance right it's mm -hmm. to make sure that um, our employees and our teams um, and our audiences respond well to that content if they are not responding well to the content there's a gap there um, and maybe the gap is around building that awareness and helping them to understand why and your motivations. And maybe that gap is, is just not landing well. And you have to be honest about that as well. Um, so, so that would be my thought on that, that question. And before we move to you, Megan, real quick, I just want to reflect on that for a second. I love the idea that, you know, use imagery of the, your space, the people that you're with that are like, if you're, that's your goal, right? Like, like you want to reflect the, your organization, use, use those people. That's awesome. And, I, I, and then the other idea, oh gosh, so many, so things, my brain, I can't remember what it is. <sighs> it's been one of those days. The other thing, oh man, <laughs> what was it? Because it was really good. I was trying to hold on to the one thought so I could get to the other thought. Well, it will come back to me, but I know, but I love these ideas of uh, just, you know, oh, you're, the, the notes, because I love that, that you can be intentional in that, right? Like you can, you can, you don't want to, you're not just trying to explain it away or, or, you know, just a, but I love that idea that like, hey, this is what we're trying to do here. I think that's a brilliant idea because I think it gives people reason to be like, oh, okay. And then it kind of puts me at ease that I can be like, this is why this is. So I, I don't know if it works for every scenario, but I love that idea that like we can be intentional and in, in kind of prepping the person to understand what they're going to see. So I, I don't know if you have experience using that, but that's, I mean, at least on the surface level of the conversation today, I think, wow, that's, that could be really powerful. I think that could be really yeah, interesting. We've, Go ahead. In some of our courses, we've embedded what we call trigger warnings. We don't name it that, in the, but it's just yeah. kind of naming this data might have an impact on you, right? Before the learner gets into it. Um, and then the, I, I also think that if you're choosing to reflect your current diversity levels, right? There are ways that you could increase diversity not maybe not through reflective imagery because we now know that this is not creating the impact on our learner the way that we want but maybe when we're sourcing the photos of our team what photographers are we hiring right like who's capturing this media is there a way to increase the per to increase the diverse perspectives on that media still without being inauthentic to what's represented in our organization so that's why i say this is integrative into every aspect of your work, right? Not just right. in the pictures that you choose, but who's taking your pictures? Who would you pay to take those pictures? Could you be paying a, 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 a mar person in a marginalized body to do that? Is that another way to increase equity in a more authentic way? Yeah, love it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna chime in, you know, from a practical perspective, right? Um, and um, actually, a lot of these things that Jess is mentioning and I'm mentioning are in a resource guide that we can make available for download. And so this would be a great time. I know in the chat, somebody's asked for like, do you have a checklist or a template? We do. Um, so, and, and the checklist <laughs> and the template talks about media representation. It has, um, it has places to go for that. Um, but then also has some of these, these processes, these organizational um, checklists. So, you know, I would say, um, a lot of what Torrance Learning does in our own marketing, for example, we show pictures of our team and our space and, and things like that. And we are 85% white. Um, we are, our, our, our headquarters is in a community that's probably 98% white, right? We go out of our way to try to recruit and reach and when we find them, support them through that process, that hiring process so that they feel welcome. But then on our website, right, we have more than 15% 
images of people of color, right? So we overrepresent. It is authentic. They are our people, but we do slightly overrepresent images. So I think if of our, I'm thinking our five banner images of our website, right? That scroll through like everybody else's banner images scroll through, um, right? That I, I believe that those are 40% people of color, right? Um, and and things like that. And we we've had um, learning and development is a, a Field that has a lot of uh, women in it. And so historically, we've also been trying to overrepresent the men in our company. And um, when we recruit, we want to make sure that we are putting forth our, our a representative face. Um, and also a spit like, I want people to say, Hey, I can see myself here. And so we actually get a little bit self-conscious because it tends to be our recruiting team, um, tends to be because, and because the people of color at Torrance Learning also happen to be women. Um, we end up with a very you know, like female front, <laughs> like when you, you, that, that you need to pat, right. This gauntlet of women that you need to pass in order to get hired here. Um, and we have to say like, actually we do have guys here. Um, <laughs> they're just not in the hiring, you know, in, in this hiring stream. So um, we make some, and some of our clients ask us to, you know, please slightly overrepresent because our goals are to make people feel comfortable. Our goals are to attract, but then also to be authentic. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of talking, but <laughs> no, I love, love it. Process. Love it. Love it. Uh, I, I, gosh, so many good things. And I, I want to keep going and have more conversation, but our time's getting short. So let me ask you this, uh, Megan and Jess, you, we, we shared the resource that you provided in the, in the chat. So we'll post that along with the, the episode. If you're listening to the podcast or watching the video later, uh, if that's okay with, with the two of you, uh, what I, what I'd ask now, are there other resources or other things we as consumers of this and talking about this co topic, if we wanted to go learn more, we really want to get better at this. How, where, where should we go? What, you, you know, I guess we'll just call up Jess and say, Hey Jess, I've got five questions for you. Can you, uh, we won't do that to you, Jess. Um, but where, where should we go? Where should we like, what resources, what recommendations would you give us in terms of empowering us to go and get better. Oh gosh, there's time. <laughs> who wants to go? Megan, Jess, who, which one is the first? Uh, Megan, I'll go, go ahead. a couple of books that have been really helpful for me, um, but then also just, um, I think part of it is just kind of opening up your, your, your lens and listening, right. And, 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 and finding things and saying, oh, that's, that's something I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to follow that. Right. Um, uh, we, and we'll get to the links to these two, uh, Matt, um, we, as a company read the book. So you want to talk about race, which was really, really very powerful, um, as a, a company read and it's set up very well as a, a book club kind of thing. It works really well that way. Um, but, um, just mentioned it through the book blind spot which deals with not only race but a number of different di dimensions of um inclusion and an implicit bias and that was really really interesting as a, a an opportunity to to explore that and and that's uh, published by the folks who, who put out the implicit association test also out of harvard um, which is just a really very eye-opening place to start yeah. and i would say in the resource guide that we just handed, there are a lot of um, places where you can derive um, diverse content. So a lot of media choices, a lot of platforms that are offering free stock imagery that are very inclusive of diverse um, bodies. Um, and, and so that that would be like my, my big cue up. But those two books help you to, to build a foundation for understanding and analysis, um, especially Blind Spot, which helps you to identify some of those biases. And then I would say, the, the Harvard Implicit Association test um, to see where some of those blind spots or biases might be. Yeah, okay. Well, well thank you for both for, for sharing those resources. I will say, uh, and this is not meant to be a plug, but I know TechSmith has just added a whole bunch more of its uh, the stock resources to its stock library for Camtasia and Snagit. So now it's up to like 20 million different pieces of media. Many of those I'm sure are sound effects that no one will ever use. And some of them are, are, are music, but I, I, I have not checked, so I can't guarantee, but I would hope in, in that large of a volume of library, 
that there are many more diverse options than, than previously. So hopefully as you're looking for media, that's another place you can go is uh, to the Camtasia Asset Library or Snagit Asset Library. So, okay. So this has been a wonderful conversation, but we're gonna end on uh, a little bit of, of what, the way we always end here at the Visual Lounge. We're gonna go into our speed round questions. So here we go. Okay, so speed round questions. The, the, the goal of speed round questions is these are meant to be fast, quick answers, a uh, little bit lighter topic conversation, a little bit more fun. Uh, and if I can ever get my questions up here, we're going to go through them. So, uh, Jess, I'm going to put you on the spot because Megan told me it was okay to do this. Uh, what, what is your favorite <laughs> home improvement project you've been working on? I know right now you're out of country. You're not doing that uh, right now, but she said you do a lot. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Even right now? <laughs> All right. Yes, we got contractors in the house right now. Um, the we're renovating our basement so we have a thousand square foot basement that we completely oh. opened up um it was three rooms it was it's in detroit so it was an old like detroit basement um we had to move all of our mechanical into a utility closet which meant moving water mains getting a whole new hvac system getting all new ductwork. um and so we just got our bathroom so we, we also uh, added a bathroom, a full full bathroom down there. We're going to add a little mini kitchenette. It's going to be like a little studio apartment. Um, and that is, we just finished the bathroom. We finished our epoxy floors because, you know, oh. if you don't know, Detroit basements flood. So yeah. I could not do the laminate floors I dreamed of. Um, but I got epoxy floors that have copper in them, which is my favorite addition yet. It's beautiful. It looks like marble with copper in it. So. Sounds That's awesome. <laughs> Sounds like a great place to have a party. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Next question is for you, Megan. Uh, what What is the best thing about running a small business in Michigan? Oh, gosh. Small business in Michigan. Um, so one of the things that uh, people love about Michigan is our beautiful Michigan summers and all of the lakes. Um, and one of the things that people hate about Michigan is our cold, wet, mushy, gray winters. Um, and so we've kind of played with that a little bit. Um, as a team, we're still small enough that um, when we have our annual company picnic, as long as it's not a pandemic, um, one of our team members has a lovely uh, little home on a lake. And so it's great. Like we get to have a picnic on a lake and kids are playing and there's a bonfire. And it's, it's just, if we were a big company, we couldn't all show up at Linda's house and have a picnic. <laughs> um, and then in the winter, um, we, we uh, twice a year, we run a, a, a free conference around um, uh, XAPI, which is a learning data specification. We actually call that the XAPI party and joke that nobody would come to Michigan in December for a conference if we didn't call it a party. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's and if you have not been to the XAPI party, you've not partied quite yet. So uh, it's it's well worth checking that out as well. So so next question, Megan, we'll start with you, and it'll be the same question for you, Jess. You get a you get a little bit of more lead time than Megan does. Where's one place you turn for inspiration? I. So I am uh, on the board at the Ann Arbor Hands On Museum. And one thing that that has done is it's really fueled my passion for these, like, you know, I spend my days in front of a screen and you go to a science museum and there's things to touch and explore and ideas you never had, like any idea, like how things work. Those, those are my passion. Uh, I got all whipped up this morning coming out of a meeting I had at the, at the museum. And uh, so that's a, a good source of inspiration for me. I love it. I love it. What about you, Jess? Where do you turn for inspiration? And this is, uh, it's uh, spiritual for me. Uh, so I, I think I, I return to water and prayer um, and uh, just being like I'm here in Bahia, which is where I studied abroad in Brazil for, for three months. And now I'm back because the water is inspiring to me and it, it has really affected my clarity and my ability to communicate. Um, and so I go inward and I pray um, and I, I am just grateful for natural resources. Oh, that's that's beautiful. And I'm sure it's much warmer there than it is here today. Windy, oh, cold it's, Michigan. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So one more question for you each. And again, uh, 
you can, you can decide who goes first. So one of you is going to get a little heads up. This is, we, we preface this by saying to everybody, this is the hardest question we ask uh, throughout the entire show. Okay. So you can imagine what that's like. Uh, and it's because it's most people don't know what to, what to do with it. <laughs> the question is, what's one question you want to ask me? So you get to turn it around to me. So uh, who wants to go first? Megan? Jess? Rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> what do you get to go? Uh, I, I will ask, what is your, this is a person, I'm just going to ask Please, what came to me instinctively. The first thing that came up, what's your Perfect. favorite food and restaurant? <laughs> oh, uh, so, so many foods. I love eating. Uh, like if you'd seen me a, a year ago, you would know I really loved eating. Um, I, <laughs> I love so many different, like, uh, different ethnic foods, like Asian, trying Asian foods and just going and trying stuff new. But gosh, what's my favorite thing I've ever eaten? I love a good Indian dish. Like seriously, just, you know, something that's, uh, uh, the one with the cheese in it. I love that so much. I could eat it all the time. Paneer? Um, paneer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paneer. Uh, I, but I also love like pho, uh, like a Vietnamese pho. And um, I'm not super adv adventurous on spicy, but, you know, my kids are. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go and like, I just had some hot chicken that was really, I just love food. That's, so that's probably like the worst question to ask me because I have like, I just love to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, give so me food. I had the lots to follow up. All right. I the logical follow-up, because the last time I saw you, you were running <laughs> down the street in Salt Lake for yeah. exercise, not out of fear. So, um, it's, so how's the running going? Oh, that is that's a, a, a it's it's a good question, Megan. It's a little painful of an answer. I have not been running for a couple of weeks because one of my knees. Every time I get about 18, 20 minutes out, one of my knees just starts giving way and hurting. So I've been trying to rest. Mm -hmm. However, I did sign up for a half marathon at the end of next May. So that will take wow. me more than 18 or 20 minutes, my friend. Yeah. So I've got, so I'm trying to rest, trying to do some recovery right now, some stretches and stuff like that. But <laughs> like, uh, so I, for those that watch the show and know me a little bit, I started running on my birthday, uh, this year and with the goal to run 10 K, uh, as a, as a distance. And I did that at, my goal was end of summer. I did it on the day before the uh, last day of summer in September. And so I was really proud of that. And, uh, Megan, that's what you were seeing a little bit of. And so I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I was a person that said, I hate running. And now I've learned that I actually kind of like it when I'm not out of shape, which I'm quickly getting back out of shape. So it's going to be painful to go back again, but, uh, yeah, so that's how it's going. It's not been great, but <laughs> I'm still trying. <laughs> and I've, I'm convinced I've convinced my 15 year old to start running with me as well and, uh, help him get even more healthy and, we're, we're working on it together. So it's a good question. Awesome. All right. Well, Megan and Jess, thank you so much for spending time with me on this, on this, this, I, I think this sensitive, important topic. Uh, thank you for your advice, your wisdom. Uh, thank you for not, uh, you know, dragging me through the coals, coals for anything I've said inappropriately or wrongly. Um, and I just want to address, I know a lot of people watch or listen to these shows and they think, oh, what does this have to do with Camtasia or TechSmith? That's not always our goal. Our goal is to start thinking about media and using video in the workplace, using video for learning, development, design, using images in multiple ways, whether it's how to create them better, how to use them more effectively. We talk about learning science. So we talk a lot about things on the show because it's important and because it all comes together as we are creators together. As creators, we need to be thinking about these things and our creations have impact. And so we hope that helps you understand the why. Why do we talk about these things on the Visual Lounge? It's not to teach you how to use Camtasia. Lots of great tutorials. If you want to go watch those, go check out the Camtasia certification. Go to our tutorials uh, on our website. Those will teach you that clip, what buttons to click. But in every video that we create, there's so much more to it that you need to understand. So Jess, Megan, thank you once again for joining me today. Just as we, we log out today, and, and I just want to say a big thanks to, to everybody that helps out. Jesse O'Dano, behind the scenes, Andy Owen, who provided me some major technical support to get me up and running here in the TechSmith studio versus at home, where I don't have power still, I'm pretty sure. But you know what we do is if you're liking what you're hearing, you can keep watching on YouTube as future shows come up, or you can find us on any of your favorite podcast platforms. You can look for The Visual Lounge. And we always like it if you like, subscribe, share, because that helps us out. We will see you all next week with an awesome show. We're going to be talking about the video viewer study with Dr. Jane Bozarth. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>